The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and thank you for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today. My name is Lori and my colleague Brittany and I will be managing the session today. We are fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Christopher Rosenberry, the Deer and Elk Section Supervisor for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. He'll be talking to us about the impact of predators on white-tailed deer fawns in Pennsylvania. We expect the presentation to last about 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer period of 10 to 15 minutes. You can ask a question by typing into the type question here box on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right of your screen. For those of you dialing in to listen today, please note that this is not a toll-free call and you may receive long distance charges from your service provider. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Christopher Rosenberry. Thanks. Good afternoon. As Lori mentioned, my name is Chris Rosenberry. I am a wildlife biologist who supervises the Pennsylvania's deer and elk programs. Welcome to this webinar. Today we'll take a look at whether whitetail fawns in Pennsylvania are under attack and has the impact of predators on deer changed over the last few decades. Photos like this are one of the reasons we are talking about fawn survival today. As evidenced by this photo from Bedford County, there's no questions that predators kill fawns in Pennsylvania. They always have and they always will. However, over the years, predator populations have changed and people want to know if this has caused a change in fawn survival and in deer population abundance. Are deer fawns under attack and how is predation affecting deer populations in Pennsylvania? I will address these questions in this program today, but first I'll provide some background information on the most important predators of deer populations in Pennsylvania. White-tailed deer and black bears have shared Penn's woods for a long time. And since 1980, bear populations have more than quadrupled. In 1980, there were less than 5,000 bears in Pennsylvania. Over the last 35 years, the population has increased to the point that today there are nearly 20,000 bears. This increase is due to range expansion. In other words, bears are living in parts of Pennsylvania where they were not found in 1980 as well as population increases in the traditional bear range. Black bears are omnivores, which means they will eat plants and animals and other things, including garbage, like the bear in this photo. They find food mainly by scent and do not rely on their vision for detecting food. Over the course of a year, a bear's diet will be greater than 75% vegetarian. They will eat whatever is most abundant. And if they can catch a fawn or other animal, they will eat those as well. When people talk about predators and deer fawns, the coyote is most often the topic of conversation. The coyote has been a part of Pennsylvania's wildlife community for a long time. Photos dating to the 1930s have appeared in the Pennsylvania Game News magazine. And this photo is of a coyote that was killed during the rifle deer season in the 1940s in Clearfield County. In recent years, coyote harvests have increased as interest in hunting and trapping this predator has increased. This graph shows the number of hunters and trappers who pursued coyotes, shown by the blue bars, and the number of coyotes harvested, shown by the red bars. As interest in coyote hunting and trapping has increased, so too has the harvest. Unlike bears, we do not have population estimates of coyotes in Pennsylvania. Instead, we have to rely on an index of hunter success. Because coyote harvest have increased with greater hunter participation, we need to standardize the hunter effort to calculate an index to the coyote population. This graph shows the coyote harvest that has been standardized to the number of coyotes harvested per 100 hunter days. Over the last few decades, the success rate of hunters has increased. In other words, they are harvesting more coyotes for every 100 days of hunting. This suggests an increase in the coyote population. Coyotes are found throughout Pennsylvania, including the heavily populated areas surrounding our largest cities, and they also are omnivores, like bears. To provide a sense of scale, coyotes weigh 35 to 55 pounds. A young white-tailed deer fawn will weigh about 10 pounds, give or take. 
In Pennsylvania, coyote diets include deer, insects, and small mammals. And in a Pennsylvania study of coyote diets, vegetation and deer were found in more than half of the coyotes examined. Bobcats do not garner the attention of coyotes and bears as predators of fawns, but they certainly do kill fawns. Similar to coyotes, we do not have population estimates of bobcats in Pennsylvania, so we must again rely on an index to population size. In this case, incidental captures of bobcats by trappers is used as an index to the bobcat population abundance and distribution. From these data, it is clear that bobcat abundance has increased over the last few decades. In addition, today bobcats can be found in most of Pennsylvania. Only in the far western and southeastern wildlife management units are bobcats absent or poorly established. Unlike bears and coyotes, bobcats are strict carnivores. And compared to bears and coyotes, bobcats are a relatively small predator with weights typically from 15 to 20 pounds. Large individuals may weigh up to 35 pounds. The primary prey for bobcats is deer and small animals, such as rabbits, mice, and birds. Bobcats will take fawns, but bobcat kills typically occur once the fawns begin moving around and are more visible to a predator that hunts by sight. The previous slides provide a quick overview of three of the primary predators of white-tailed deer fawns in Pennsylvania. Although the predators may vary in their diets and methods of detecting prey, they all have increased in abundance and distribution in recent decades. Often when one considers increasing predator population, the focus does in fact turn to deer and their most vulnerable life stage, which is fawns from birth to 34 weeks or about nine months of age. <clears throat> Beginning in 2000, the Game Commission began a continuous series of field studies to learn more about white-tailed deer. Two of these studies have focused on fawn survival. The first was conducted from 2000 to 2001. The second started in 2015 and will continue through 2017. By monitoring survival and determining mortality causes, these two studies provide an opportunity to compare predator impacts on young fawns. Radio collars allow us to monitor fawn survival. When a fawn is captured, a transmitter with an expandable collar is placed on the fawn. The expandable collar will adjust to the fawn's neck as it grows, and the transmitter will allow us to monitor the fawn's movements and survival. If a fawn dies, the radio collar will send out a mortality signal that we can then track to the fawn that has died. When that mortality signal is detected, we use telemetry to locate the collar. Sometimes it is rel it's relatively easy to find the fawn, such as the fawn in this photo, where the body is intact and laying uncovered on the forest floor. Other times it is more difficult to locate the fawn. In this fawn there is in this photo there is a fawn that's been covered with leaves and soil by a predator. If you look closely below the whiteboard, you will see a leg and below that the fawn's head. This photo provides a good example of how well fawn's coloration blends into the forest floor. The fawn's leg and head look just like the leaves that are surrounding them. Once the fawn has been located, we try to determine the cause of mortality. In the field, we record details of the kill site and collect the entire fawn carcass. We will then conduct a necropsy of the fawn to determine cause of death. If predation is suspected, we also swab the carcass to collect DNA. The DNA will be used to confirm the species of predator that caused the mortality. In this case, a bobcat is the suspected cause of death, but we have not received confirmation on the particular predator species from the lab. In case you were unable to make out the fawn's leg and head in the previous photo, here are the fawn's remains, remains after being uncovered. Only the head and one front leg was found. Now that we've covered some of the field methods we use to monitor survival and determine causes of mortality, we will look at the results of our field studies. The 2000 to 2001 fawn survival study was completed in two different habitats. The northern study area was conducted in forested habitat on state game lands and state forest land. 
The southern study was a mix of forest and fields. 218 fawns were captured during the two-year study. For the remainder of the presentation, I will focus on the forest study site because it most closely resembles our current fawn study areas. During the 2000 to 2001 study, predators caused most of the mortalities on the forest study area. These graphs show the percent of fawns that survived and died through 34 weeks of age and the mortality causes. 38% of fawns survived, 70% of the mortalities were caused by predators. Predation on the forest study area was evenly split by predator species. This graph shows the predator caused mortalities by species. Bears and coyotes each accounted for about a third of the predator mortalities. Bobcats and unknown predators accounted for the remaining third. Predators killed most fawns within the first few weeks of life. This graph shows the number of fawns killed by predators as shown by the red bars by weeks after capture. As can be seen by nine weeks of age, most predator caused mortalities already have occurred. So to summarize the 2000 to 2001 fawn survival studies, forested uh, study area results, about four in 10 fawns survived at 34 weeks of age, and most of the mortality was caused by predators during the first few weeks of life. We'll now move on to the current study. The 2015 to 17 fawn survival study is occurring on large forested areas. The northern study area is located on the Susquehannock State Forest. The southern study area is located on Bald Eagle and Rothrock State Forest. And 42 fawns were captured during the first year of this study. Survival results from the first year of the current study are very similar to the forest study area from the 2000 to 2001 study. This graph shows the percent of fawns surviving to 34 weeks of age. Not only are the survival curves similar during the first nine weeks, but at 26 weeks and 34 weeks, the results from the 2000 to 2001 study, as noted by the two individual blue diamonds, are almost identical to the 2015 results. And those results are indicated by the red line. The species of predators killing fawns also are similar between the studies. Bears and bobcats, or bears and coyotes, again are even in the number of fawns that they've taken. However, based on physical evidence, we have identified more bobcat predation in the first year of the current study. And once we get the final DNA results from the lab, some of the predator kills may be moved into different species categories for the 2015 study. So despite changes in predator populations, impact on fawns is similar between our field studies to date. Fawn survival to 34 weeks of age is very similar after one year of the current study, right around 40% for both studies. The percent of mortalities attributed to predators also is similar, between 60 and 70% for both studies. Unfortunately, these field studies, because of their limited areas, may not represent the entire state. And as a result, we use other statewide data sets to monitor the impact of predators in all wildlife management units. If you recall this slide, mortality causes by week from the 2000 to 2001 study, we saw that most predator mortalities occurred early in a fawn's life. If we look at this graph in the context of when deer hunting seasons occur, we can see that predators have had their impact on fawns by the time most hunters are in the woods. Fawns that are taken by hunters represent those that survive predation. So if predation on fawns increases, then the number of fawns in the harvest should decline. For this reason, we monitor predator impacts by looking at fawn to doe ratios from the hunting season. For those of you who may be eating lunch or have a weak stomach, I promise this will be the last dead deer slash deer parts photo. However, sometimes it's important to realize that wildlife work can be dirty and bloody. And such is the case when during the firearm season, trained game commission personnel 
Visit butcher shops throughout the state and age deer by looking at tooth wear and replacement. We use the collected age and sex data to estimate fawn to doe ratios and deer population trends in all units. To decide if predators are having an unacceptable impact on deer populations, we look at the fawn to doe ratio and deer population trends over time. If fawn to doe ratio is declining and the deer population trend is below objective, then we have a problem that needs to be addressed. We have two areas where we can focus our attention. First, we can try and reduce the number of predators by increasing predator harvest. However, to reduce bear and coyote populations, there will be problems. For bears, only about 20% of deer hunters support reducing bear populations to increase deer population. So deer hunter support is lacking for this option. On the other hand, for coyotes, most deer hunters favor reducing coyote populations. However, there is little that can be done to increase hunting coyote hunting opportunities. Coyotes already can be hunted 24 hours a day for 365 days a year. So with few acceptable options for increasing predator harvest, we can look to reduce deer harvest. In this case, the best option is to reduce the antlerless harvest as needed to keep deer population trend at objective. And it's important to note that these options are being considered at the wildlife management unit scale, which in Pennsylvania is a scale of about 2,000 square miles on average. On a more local scale, other options might exist, such as intensive predator removal or efforts to improve habitat to increase deer productivity. But on a large management unit scale, adjusting deer harvest is the most practical option. If we look at the latest data from Pennsylvania, we see that deer populations remain sustainable in all wildlife management units with population trends that are stable or increasing. We have detected declines in fawn to doe ratios in wildlife management units 2B and 3D. And those are the two units with cross hatching on this slide. However, we see no indication that the fawn to doe ratios are affecting population trends because both units have stable deer populations. As a result, we've not recommended any management actions in these WMUs to address predator impacts. And it should be pointed out that unit 2B actually contains the city of Pittsburgh and surrounding communities. As a result, the declining fawn to doe ratio is probably not due to any increase in predators or predation by four-legged predators. Vehicles and two-legged predators could be a cause, but not bears, coyotes, and bobcats. To summarize our results from field studies and statewide monitoring, we return to the questions posed at the title of the program. Are Pennsylvania fawns under attack and have things changed? Yes, the world is a tough place for newborn fawns and forested habitat, predators will kill about a third of all the fawns that are born. However, we've not detected any change in fawn survival between our two field studies to this point. Across Pennsylvania, deer populations remain productive and sustainable. Deer populations are stable or increasing and at or above management objectives. And finally, we have these management actions that we can take to address predator or other deer population problems should one exist. Based on research and experience in Pennsylvania, when necessary, the recommended option is to reduce the analyst harvest and keep the deer populations at objective. So with that, I guess we will take some questions. All right. So we do have a few questions. Um, we have a couple of folks that are curious about Fishers, to, to know if uh, fishers impact um, predation on fawns at all. Okay. I mean, Pennsylvania does have a, uh, a fisher population that's similar to the other predator populations that we talked about, uh, is increasing and expanding its range. Uh, and we do know that fishers will take fawns. In terms of their impact on Pennsylvania fawns, uh, to date we've not identified any uh, predator mortalities. We do have some DNA swabs from uh, fawns that were killed last summer uh, that we didn't, uh, weren't able to identify a specific predator. Some of those could come back as a fisher kill, uh, but at this point we've not documented any fisher kill uh, of a fawn uh, on our current study. Okay. Some of these other questions may not be your expertise, so you let us know what you're comfortable answering. All right. 
This, um, let's see, Gabriel wants to know, why do you speculate, did the number of incidental bobcat captures increase so much in 2014? Yeah, that is beyond uh, my area of expertise. We would have to go to the fur bear biologist to, to answer that. I don't know why uh, that spike in 2014. Okay, Gabriel, if you'd like to send that question to um, the PGC comments at pa.gov email address, we can try to answer it that way for you. Uh, let's see. So wait, here's another one about fur bearers. Um, will the Game Commission consider allowing cable restraint all year for coyotes? Again, that's uh, something that the fur bear biologist would be better uh, suited to, to respond to. All right. Better sent through the PGC comments at PA.gov there, Pat. Okay, so here we go. How about mountain lions? Uh, we've not, similar to fishers, we've not documented a mountain lion kill of fawns in Pennsylvania. Uh, in terms of whether we have them or not, certainly that's open for debate. And any time you're out talking about deer and predation, uh, that uh, topic does come up. Uh, what we can say is that uh, there's all sorts of things that can be found running around Pennsylvania over the years. We've picked up wallabies, we've picked up uh, serval uh, in the southeast, uh, an African cat that somebody had uh, that had gotten out. Folks have been prosecuted for having mountain lions illegally in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've also seen a wildcat from South Dakota travel to Connecticut. So could there be a mountain lion running around Pennsylvania? There could be all sorts of things running around Pennsylvania. Uh, but we have not detected it as a mortality cause for fawns at this point, so we doubt that they're having much of an impact if they exist in Pennsylvania. All right. Robert um, has a question. Where does the statement low deer hunter support to reduce bear population come from? That is from a survey uh, that we conducted back in uh, 2014 of deer hunters. Uh, they were asked, basically, we were looking at these options, what could we do uh, to address this predation uh, issue as it relates to fawns, and so uh, we surveyed 6,000 deer hunters across the state, and that was the response. Only 20% of them were in favor of reducing bear populations uh, to increase deer populations. Here's a question from Bill. He wants to know, why do we not trap deer from high population areas and relocate them? I think right now the biggest reason we would not want to do that is because of chronic wasting disease. Uh, and the example I've used is if we have an area where we have high deer populations uh, and we have those areas, say, around Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, uh, those folks, a lot of times, they, their first thought is, let's trap them and move them someplace else. Uh, We'll also then hear from hunters on game lands where they're not seeing as many deer as they want, and they want us to move those deer to those game lands. And then, therefore, the, the assumption is, is that if we move all these deer out of Pittsburgh or Philadelphia area to the, the game lands, that the deer populations will be higher and hunters will see them. Uh, one, there's no guarantee that those animals are going to make it and be there in the fall uh, when the hunters uh, are out there. Uh, they're not going to necessarily just stay on a game lands. Uh, they will move around, and oftentimes deer that are relocated will seek out areas that they're familiar with or similar areas, so they may end up in another community someplace else. And secondly, the chronic wasting disease issue is a real serious concern here in Pennsylvania. The worst thing that could happen would be if we decided, okay, we're going to do what the people in the communities want, we're going to take a bunch of their deer out, and we're going to put them out on the game lands where the hunters want them, and then we find out that in that area, chronic wasting disease has just been detected. We now have potentially just moved CWD into uh, another area in the state, and that simply is not a risk that we're willing to take. So for those two reasons, moving deer is not an option here. All right. Dave has a question about the 2015 fawn study. Why were there only 42 fawns in the 2015 study and there were more than 200 in the earlier study? The 2015 study was, uh, there's, the main reason for it is we don't, we're not using as many people. Uh, we don't have, the, we're not using as 
uh, the resources that we had in the uh, earlier study to catch fawns. So we simply do not have the number of folks uh, searching the areas. And secondly, uh, I think that's probably the biggest reason. We just don't have the people on the ground that we had back in the, uh, the 2000 study. I think back then we had almost double. So back in 2000, 2001, we were averaging around 100 uh, fawns a year uh, with twice as many people. This year we had half as many and we caught 42. So the, the numbers weren't too bad given the effort that was put into it. Okay. Jeff is asking if red or gray foxes are predators of fawns. Uh, I would certainly think they will kill them. Uh, a young fawn is just going to lay there. Uh, even if, a, you know, when we're catching fawns, oftentimes you just walk over and pick them up. They're not going to move. Uh, so if a fox would come across one, I, I wouldn't see any reason why a fox would not try to kill one. Uh, and if they got a, a, you know, a good first attack on the fawn, they certainly could kill it. Uh, and I'll just throw in a little public service announcement here as we're getting close to fawning season. If you find a fawn laying out there, do not assume that it's orphaned. Uh, the does oftentimes are close by. What we find is some does will show up and uh, you know charge you if you have their fawn. Uh, other ones you'll never see them, or you or you may see them, but they're staying back away from it. Uh, but that's just that's the uh, you know a method of the, the fawn the deer use to avoid fawn predation is to not have that large doe walking around a fawn that's not going to escape many predators. So. The fawns lay down, they hide, they don't move, the does go away, and they come back to visit the fawn a couple times a day uh, to nurse it and things like that. So if you do see a fawn here in the next few weeks just laying and there's no doe around, please do not assume it's orphaned and please do not pick it up. Doug is curious if you can tell that the fawn is dead, should they report it? If the fawn is dead and it has a radio collar on it or just if a fawn is dead? Uh, no specifics. Okay. Uh, if a fawn is, if it's just a fawn that's dead, I wouldn't uh, worry about reporting it. Uh, we know that happens. I mean, just with our own study, we know that that happens. About you know, sixty percent of the fawns that are born on our particular study sites have died. So, if it's just an individual, I wouldn't uh, report it. If you happen to come across an animal with a collar, uh, there are toll-free numbers on the collar as well as the ear tags. And we would certainly encourage anybody that finds a radio collar or ear tag deer to call the toll-free number uh, on the tag. Uh, if it is a tag deer and it does not have a toll-free number, uh, I would still encourage you to contact the Game Commission because that means that it's a deer that has escaped from a captive facility, and we would like to know about that as well. Al asks, does thinning disease have an impact on fawn mortality? Maybe is that uh, chronic, chronic wasting, wasting disease? disease. Uh, in terms of fawn mortality, I think if the uh, it potentially could affect fawn mortality be, as it affects the uh, the female's condition. Uh, we see that with other factors that can affect the, the doe's condition that that can uh, have an impact on fawn survival. I think the biggest issue with chronic wasting disease really is uh, the mortality that it causes to the older animals. Trevor wants to know, has there been a close evaluation of how handling fawns and placing bulky equipment on them might influence their mortality in the study? That is certainly a question that we ask ourselves. Unfortunately, there's no real good way to monitor that because we need the radio collars and, uh, and the bulky equipment to uh, track the animal's survival. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, in other projects, I mean, we've, we've seen high survival. Uh, in other projects where this has been done, uh, does abandonment occur? It may occur on a handful of cases, but when we look at the mortalities, particularly the young fawns, uh, you know, oftentimes we are able to identify a specific cause. Um, but there are a couple every year that we just don't know. Uh, it could be abandonment, uh, but uh, it, it's just variable, and, and it's something that I don't know that anybody has ever been able to really look at and test uh, in a wild setting. Um, so it is something that we, we are cognizant of, but uh, can't really tell you how much it happens other than we look at the survival and, uh, and the only ones that would be abandonment would be those ones that would be in the sort of the unknown category. Um, and that's generally a, a small category of, of mortalities. Jerry is curious how you differentiate between predation and scavenging. When it comes to fawn mortality, I guess there's two parts to that. 
when it comes to the diet of predators, that part's very difficult to tell whether deer that's in um, you know, a coyote's stomach is because the coyote actually killed the deer or scavenged it. I don't know that there's any way that you can uh, distinguish between those two. For fawns, what we're looking at are uh, basically killing bite marks. Uh, that's how in hemorrhaging under the skin or around those bite wounds that would indicate that the animal was still alive when the bite wounds occurred. Uh, if we don't find those and we have you know, a part of a, a carcass or remains of a carcass, uh, then that's probably more likely to be scavenged. But if we have a, a fawn that's been killed, it has hemorrhaging around the bite marks, that would be a telltale sign that that animal was in fact killed by a predator. Jennifer is curious, is there thoughts on how weather, rain, or temperatures might affect fawn survival on a yearly basis? Uh, here in Pennsylvania, I don't know uh, that that's ever been a, a big issue. Uh, certainly in other places, uh, you will see the effects of drought uh, or rain. For example, I know there's some work that's come out of Texas um, that has shown that drought or has been a, a factor in fawn survival. But here in Pennsylvania, I mean, we have drought periods, we have some rainy periods, but our temperatures are fairly moderate uh, during that time, and, um, and I, I just don't think it's, it's that big of an issue for us. Okay. Pat is curious if we have noticed an increase in blue tongue. Again, that does occur. That's usually a late summer type of disease. Uh, we have had a few outbreaks over the years. I recall uh, 2007. I think also 2012 uh, were fairly large outbreaks, um, but in terms of an increase, I'm not sure how much of a record we have of it other than some of those more recent outbreaks to say that uh, it has been a big issue. It may have been occurring previously and it may not have been detected. Um, so right now it, it does not appear to be a major mortality issue for our, our deer on a regular basis. Okay. See, we can take a couple more. Craig is curious if you can determine the difference between a coyote kill and a stray dog kill. Uh, there are some indicators that you could use to try and distinguish between a coyote and a uh, dog. Uh, sometimes, you know, some of it may be as simple as a carcass may often be intact for a uh, domestic dog or somebody's pet because the animal's not necessarily killing the fawn to eat uh, and probably had breakfast that morning. So uh, that's one indication, but that's one of the reasons why we're using DNA uh, as part of this project. Uh, DNA was not used previously, but with the advances that we have in genetics and wildlife genetics, uh, that's why we're, we're doing the swabs to try and identify the species and, and make that determination as to whether it's a coyote kill or a dog. Okay, Brian asks, would an increase in early successional forest offer another practical opportunity to mitigate fawn predation? Potentially it could. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we do not uh, see these nice clean relationships that, in wildlife uh, studies that we would like. Uh, there has been some work done in the, the southeast where they've looked at habitat and found, unfortunately, that uh, certain habitats were trying to create that type of thing, uh, they couldn't detect a, an effect. Uh, but certainly, I would say that if you have early successional habitat in an area where it's warranted, uh, that there's other benefits to wildlife populations beyond just the fawns. Uh, so I, I, went, uh, I would, would not stop doing it because it's, it may not have an effect on fawn survival, um, but it's, it's certainly something to, to to look at, but I can't tell you for sure that it's you know, a nice tight relationship increase, that if you increase uh, early successionally, you'll see an improvement in fawn survival. It may not occur. Um, I think we have one more here that we can throw out. What can we do as hunters to help the Game Commission other than reduce the antlerless harvest as private landowners? Uh, it depends on what, I guess, your definition of help is. Uh, you know, certainly uh, landowners have uh, control of most of the property in Pennsylvania. So I guess from that standpoint, if we're talking about wildlife habitat, uh, you know, between the, the, the Game Commission and, and DCNR, I think we, the, the, 
in the uh, in probably the Allegheny National Forest and other public lands. We're looking at maybe 15 to 20 percent of Pennsylvania's public land. The other 80 percent is going to be private lands. So I think responsible habitat management on that uh, remaining 80 percent would be the best thing that uh, individuals could do, not just for the Game Commission, but for wildlife in general. All right. I think that about wraps it up. We weren't able to get to all of the questions today. So if yours is unanswered, please feel free to email pgccomments at pa.gov and we will try to get them answered that way. This session has been recorded and you should receive an email with a link to the recording within the next few hours. The recording will also be uploaded to the Game Commission's YouTube channel early next week. So I'd like to thank Dr. Rosenberry for sharing his expertise and time with us today. I'd also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon and hope you'll visit us again to learn more about Pennsylvania wildlife in upcoming webinars. Until then, we hope you're able to get outside and enjoy some of Pennsylvania's great outdoors. <laughs>